10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is commencing the Bhakti Yoga section. And there's a natural development of thought in the Bhagavad Gita, wherein Krishna has talked about first Karma Yoga and then he moved on to Dhyan Yoga and then he has said how Bhakti Yoga is the culmination or rather Bhakti itself is the culmination, the state of devotional absorption is the highest form of meditation. Now since Arjuna has said that the path of uh, Ashtanga Yoga practice or Dhyan Yoga practice for getting to the level of yogic perfection is very difficult. So Krishna will, al uh, will outline an alternative path. So he begins the seventh chapter from the point where the sixth chapter ends. Mm -hmm. The seven, seven, sixth chapter was talking about the yogis whose minds are absorbed in Krishna. That is the point that begins this chapter. Mai asaktamanaha. So let's look at this verse. Mai asaktamanaha. With mind attached to me. Yogam yunjan madashvaya. Yogam yunjan. That practice yoga. Madashvaya. Taking shelter of me. Asamshayam samagramma. That you understand me fully. Fully, assumption, free from doubt. Samagram is fully, properly. Maam, yathagya sisi. How can you know me? That Arjuna, hear from me. Kach shuru. So, let's recite the verse. Maya sattamana partha. Maya sattamana partha. Yogam yunjan madashraya. Yogam yunjan madashraya. Asamshayam samagram maam Asamshayam samagram maam Yatha gyasya sita chruru Yatha gyasya sita chruru Together Maya sattamana partha Yogam yunjan madashraya Asamshayam samagram maam Yatha gyasya sita chruru Now, English is largely a linear language. Linear means that whenever we speak a sentence, there's first the subject and then the predicate. I am starting the class now. So, normally we start with the beginning and then go towards the ending. There's a linear flow of thought. Now, of course, uh, in poetry, sometimes we may reverse the line. Starting the class, am I now? That may be done for rhyming purposes or sometimes it's a literary ornament and that's not the standard way to speak. But not all languages are necessarily linear in their structure and especially Sanskrit, they often while Prabhupada took the method of making the Sanskrit text accessible, that's why Prabhupada gave us synonyms which are Linear, the first word synonymous first, second word synonymous second. In traditional Sanskrit commentaries, there is what is called as Anvaya. So Anvaya means that you explain the words, but you explain the words by rearranging their sequence. So, so that the flow of thought becomes clear. And especially because uh, so the many of the sacred texts are also in poetry. So the flow of thought needs to be investigated. So there are different ways of understanding this verse. I'll talk about two different ways over here. That there is a there are a number of elements in this particular verse. So it is six seven point one. Now there are two ways that we can start with the beginning and go towards the ending. So then what is Krishna saying over here? That with the mind attached to me, mind asaktamana. 
and then with that element we practice yoga yogam yunyan madashraya now if we are talking about the mind attached to krishna that is clearly not karma yoga or dhyan yoga what is it bhakti yoga so the word yoga here used is referred to bhakti so we practice yoga and then by this yoga practice what happens is we or rather through this yoga practice we take shelter of krishna <coughs> now then what will happen yogam yunyan madashraya asamshayam samagram ma so by this we will become free from doubts now we have doubts we often have bouts of doubts that means there are phases like you have bout of fever and there are bouts of doubts sometimes we have doubts so then and we will know krishna fully so in now this is the linear flow of the verse and this how all this can be done here here krishna is saying arjuna listen to this this is what i am going to explain to you so in this sequence of thought the knowledge of krishna is the goal so the question here comes up if this is the sequence that how do we start with our mind attached to krishna that seems to be a little difficult to do isn't it that say whenever we start in the activity it's not that our mind is attached to the activity so now it is possible that we could attach our mind with some just an element of faith yeah maybe this is good the krishna is good but there's another way of explaining this whole sequence that krishna is telling here by here you will know me fully when you know me fully you will be free from doubts when you are free from doubts you will be inspired to take shelter of me you will understand that how i am your well wisher how i am your protector how i am your benefactor when you are inspired to take shelter of me that is when you will practice the yoga so feel it's more like not take shelter it is more inspired to take shelter and when you practice yoga that is the time your mind will become attached to you so in this sequence the idea is in this way of this is is one form of anvaya anvaya is breaking down a verse and resequencing so it is it is finding the sequence detecting the sequence uh, to make sure that we are getting the flow of thought and the point correctly so now this is another way of looking at it and this from the chapter structure chapter structural flow this seems to make more sense why because the previous chapter ended with mind attached to krishna so the process is that by hearing we come to know about krishna and the attachment of the mind is the destination it is the culmination so if we look at the overall structure of the gita now the previous can also be defended explained previous we are looking at also that we need to invest some level of attachment some level of positive attitude so if you want to look at a work of art so if somebody wants to there, there are basically there are two approaches to broadly study there is the analytical approach and there is the aesthetic approach so for example if somebody studies a flower we go into a forest and study a flower and now we could study the forest like a botanist 
and you can say okay this is the this is the stem this is the this is the carpel this is the antrusium this is the gynoecium and all those terms we can get it and that is one way of looking at it and we can study the flower as an artist where the focus is on the aesthetic appeal you know, what is the color what is the shape how is the effect of beauty coming through it and while the same object is being studied the approach is very different and the reward also is very different if you want to experience the beauty of something if you experience want to experience the joy and we want to make an emotional connect with it then which approach is more important the aesthetic approach if you want to get a, a, a functional understanding of mechanisms then which is more helpful analytical approach so there are different approaches to studying things and in general when a person is taking an aesthetic approach there has to be some emotional connect in the beginning itself hey this is beautiful let's see how this beauty has come about so in that sense while this is one way of looking at it and we will focus on this way but this is also another way that actually when we are studying about krishna there has to be some affection of the mind if we are studying god from a very skeptical cynical perspective is i talked earlier about how science takes the approach does the science take the aesthetic approach or the analytical approach analytical approach so science operates with controlled experiments and the problem with controlled experimental approach to god is that we can't control god in fact he said to understand krishna we need to stand under krishna <laughs> so humility is the first aspect krishna says even in the uh, acquiring knowledge the 13th chapter amanitvam amanitvam is in 13.8 the first element that krishna talks about so that's why while the analytical approach can be used no doubt but there has to be at least some element of affection some element of appreciation so when we invest some emotion then what will happen is if you go back to this when we invest some emotion okay so many people are worshiping krishna and so many people sing his name so many people poets throughout history have talked about him maybe there's something worth exploring over here so with that investment of little openness little emotion we practice yoga and the practice of yoga is to take shelter of krishna mm -hmm. it is it is chanting it's not just a mechanical muttering of mantras that is also helpful marginally but the experience of krishna comes to take shelter and then as we take shelter of krishna then that also gives us knowledge the dhami buddhi yogam tam we will get knowledge so the practice of yoga can also give us knowledge and that can also that can free us from doubts and that can give us knowledge so that is also a possible way of looking at it but let's focus over here that the other ways by hearing we know about krishna so in one sense these two can very well be cyclic this approach can feed into this approach and this approach can also feed into this way now we we may start by hearing and get some mind attached to krishna and because of mind attached to krishna we will practice yoga and that may also inspire us to hear more to become free from doubts and know krishna more so it's a cyclic process but either way what krishna is going to do is give arjuna an alternative pathway to become attached to him to make his mind attached to him to uh, experience bhakti for what it is so with that context krishna sta uh, krishna starts by explaining about the if we have to fix our mind on something so there is a i discussed bhakti is the process 
But the process of bhakti, the essence, bhakti is an emotion. It's an emotion of love. It's an emotion of devotion. Now, the emotions generally, emotions need an object for the emotion. Isn't it? That means, like, what is your emotion? Even a relationship, if somebody says in Facebook, they people put their status, married or single or whatever. Somebody says, I'm married. Okay, whom are you married? Oh no, I'm married in general. <laughs> there is no marriage in general, isn't it? Marriage is particular. So if somebody says, now what has happened? A lot of psychologists have found gratitude is very helpful. And even in Android and Apple, you find gratitude journals, people say, try to cultivate gratitude, which is good. But many times, because the ethos of the world is much more secular and, and non-religious, so people don't want to associate with God. So they say, I'm grateful. Okay, who am I grateful? No, I'm grateful in general. <laughs> okay. okay, you can have an attitude of gratitude. That's fair enough. But when we experience the emotion of, emotion of gratitude, that has to be directed towards something. Uh, so people take a cop out. I'm grateful to the universe. They don't want to God, so I'm grateful to the universe. So, but the idea is that emotions need to be directed towards some object. Now, so bhakti is both at one level an emotion. Bhakti itself is an emotion. Now, bhakti yoga is the process to experience that emotion. Bhakti yoga is the connection through devotion. Now, a bhakti yoga is not just a process to experience the emotion. It is also to express the emotion. If we have emotion, we express it to bhakti. If we don't have the emotion, by practicing the process, we experience the emotion and bhakti is also a way to enrich the emotion. So if I have it, if I don't have it, I ex experience it. If I have it, I express it. And when I express it, it becomes enriched. So bhakti yoga is the process for, it is the process of deepening that emotional connect with Krishna. But Bhakti Yoga cannot be talked about without the object of devotion. And that is why from this chapter onwards, Krishna will start speaking much more about himself. Prior to this, Krishna has spoken about himself relatively sparingly. Wherever it was required, that is where Krishna speaks about himself. So, if we go back over the previous six chapters, now the first reference to when you say, when you say Krishna speaks about himself, I'm talking about Krishna speaks about his divine position. So the first place he speaks about it is in 2.61, where he is answering Arjuna's question about the sthita pragya, those who are well situated. And there he is talking about sense control. So Krishna mentions about his position that he is not just the teacher of sense control, as he already is, but he is also the object of the controlled senses. That means, the object means the person we focus on after we control the senses. Then Krishna in 3.30 talks about the same way, he is not just the teacher of karma yoga, but he is also the object of offering karma in karma yoga. That he is the person to whom we offer. Now before this in 322 to 24, Krishna talks about here as when he is setting, I set an example, and Arjuna, so should you, I set an example, though I don't need to. And while explaining why I don't need to, he talks about because I am God. So he is talking about the importance of setting an example. He is teaching Arjuna over there that 
even if you are detached and you don't need to engage with the world but it's important for you to set an example for others and therefore you should do your duty so that's 322 24 now apart from that in the next chapter there is a section where krishna talks about his own divine position broadly from 4.1 to 15 that's because krishna wants to show that how he is the teacher of timeless knowledge not just he's not just teaching arjuna right now he's giving arjuna timeless wisdom and plus arjuna asks, he answers arjuna's question arjuna's question was how could he have spoken this knowledge to sun god so therefore krishna answers over there then after that in 435 435 krishna says that krishna 434 is the words that krishna says you should go to a guru and surrender to guru in 435 he is saying he talks about himself in the context of what is the vision that you get after learning from the guru and the enlightened vision that he is the he is the center of the enlightened vision that means yajnatvana punarmoham evam yasasi pandava yena bhutanya sheshani drakshasya atmanya thomai that you will see all living beings in me as mine so now after this krishna talks about his position in 529 only where he is talking about how he is the ultimate purpose of all yogas so he is talking about karma yoga he is briefly talking about dhyan yoga and he is in, in, uh, talking about how we should know him ultimately now in the 6th chapter there are a few places he talks about his position 6.15 he talks about in 6.30 to 32 and then he talks about in 6.47 all this is that he, he is talking about it to show how that the yogi is enlightened vision centers on him or rather we could say perceives him when the as the ultimate reality so when he is talking about it again what is he doing see if you look at i just briefly talk about this context and not quoted all the verses because we don't have so much time to go into it i'm making a particular point over here through all this analysis that Krishna has talked about his divine position only when the context required it. So, if we consider how much Krishna has spoken, this is first chapter has, the second chapter has 72 verses, the third chapter has 43 verses, the fourth chapter has 40 verses. The fifth chapter has 29 verses. The sixth chapter has 47 verses. So how many does this become? So if it, this is 29, so 43 plus 47 is 90. 90, 130, 130 plus, let's make it 28. This is, this is 28 then? 231, yes. So out of 231 verses, how many times has Krishna spoken about himself? This is 1, 3, 4, then here there are 15 verses, that's primary, so this is 5, this is 5 plus 15, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26 and 27. So out of 20, only, 20, only 27 out of 231, that is how much? Less than 10%. 10% more or less. So, sorry? Less than 10%. How much would be? Around 10%. 23, 23 would be? So, about 10% Krishna is speaking. So, Krishna is not speaking so much about, about himself. And why is he speaking about himself when he has to? It is to focus on completing his teachings. So now when he speaks on himself about himself, what is he doing? Now, now the focus is shifting. 
in the process of karma yoga in the process of dhyan yoga in the process of gyan yoga it is at the end they come to know that the ultimate reality that has perceived is krishna but in bhakti yoga right from beginning one has to know the ultimate reality is krishna and that ultimate reality is worth worshiping and that ultimate reality is so glorious that i should focus on that ultimate reality that i should seek shelter of that ultimate reality so now in this chapter krishna will start speaking about his divinity much more than before from this sixth chapter onwards because if the mind is to be attached to someone then we have to know about that person isn't it if say we propose start the international society for krishna consciousness and he said we should never talk about krishna <laughs> how can we have krishna consciousness isn't it so now krishna has start speaking about himself so there are some commentators who some, some not traditional commentators but contemporary analysis of the gita they say that chapter 7 to 12 and especially chapter 10 they say it is just krishna's ego trip that krishna is such a egotistic person he is saying i am the center of everything i am the whole of everything i i i is it so much i in this well actually if you want to understand whether krishna is um is egoist now we don't know no further than look at the context you know which egotist person is ready to become a charioteer of a person who's smaller than them isn't it right from the context itself uh, they is a person who has a lot of ego even if somebody is equal to them or superior to them they will be a little resentful you know i don't want to be a charioteer so let both of us go together like somebody else be a charioteer it like that if somebody is charioteer to a subordinate who is ready to do that that itself shows krishna's humility at the very least mm-hmm. now beyond that if we consider the content of the gita the in the content we will see significant restraint in speaking about his position <laughs> that is so i talk about this restraint to illustrate this point that less than t- around only about 10% of the time he is speaking about himself and that too only when the context requires and this is most of the time and then that most of the time means when speaking karma yoga dhyan yoga gyan yoga and then when he does speak about himself we will see very soon as we move forward in the seventh chapter ninth chapter krishna speaks about himself also to glorify the process of bhakti his glories are spoken to establish the glories of bhakti. so it's like a doctor may say i have treated this many pa- this patient here and this patient was critically ill and this patient was like that over there and not curable by any other method i cured him the doctor may say like that to inspire the pa- patient to take the treatment so the doctor is speaking his glory is is to inspire the patient to take the medicine to follow the treatment so just like if we talk about an example doctors glories are meant to emphasize the treatments glory that this treatment is magical it will cure you do take it that is the way in which krishna is going to talk about himself so now let's with this broad understanding let's move forward and start looking at what does krishna say about himself so krishna does not have to prove the existence of god to arjuna arjuna knows about god's existence so
so broadly speaking it is generally understood across all traditions that god is non material or as they say as we say spiritual now what does this mean that god exists beyond this do that's why sometimes people ask can future scientific advancement help us to discover god or prove the existence of god well you know god is not like an undiscovered satellite around jupiter <laughs> <laughs> that we just need to do more research if we just explore more we just develop more technology we send more space probes we'll find that missing satellite no god is not material god is spiritual so yeah he cannot be proven by material means an uh, inference can be made to his existence like we use the design argument we use the moral the moral argument is the cosmological argument these arguments are there which can be used but overall the focus is on understanding that god is someone whom we have to spiritually connect with at an individual level so krishna doesn't focus on talking about god's existence so much that when he's talking about krishna's glories his focus his own glories is talking about his focus is on how can we remember him so now if god is not material there is much philosophical discussion about god's relationship with matter with matter or you can say nature now there are broadly two attributes there is one word is which we all know very commonly transcendence and the opposite of that is immanence now how many of you have heard the word immanence okay so it's not a common word either in our philosophical discussion or in general in common in today's world but now now what does transcendence mean it means basically beyond nature that god exists beyond nature krishna talk about this later say prastasmat bhavo nyo vyakto vyakta sanatana this another world and that world is my abode that is where i reside so there is the transcendence of god that is god exists beyond nature and there is also god existing within nature that is called his immanence that if god were existing only outside nature and we exist within nature he would be completely inaccessible to us how would we even come to know him how would we be able to perceive his existence so there is the transcendence that he exists beyond nature but this also exists within nature now if there is now i use the extreme if there is only transcendence then he becomes inaccessible so inaccessible as to become irrelevant if he only exists beyond nature then uh, he doesn't matter for us mm. now if he exists only within nature then what happens is he essentially becomes material he becomes ephemeral ephemeral means he becomes temporary he it, it is if he is within nature is he really the controller of nature that is the question that comes up now now these are serious philosophical debates within the philosophy of religion and i am only giving a bare bones outline of this primarily to explain how krishna is talking about his own position so now in the history of science we all know that the initial scientists like galileo or copernicus or newton all believed in god and all of them also were pioneers of science 
So what was their understanding of the nature of the relationship between God and nature? So Newton probably phrased it most poignantly. He said, O oh Father, I think thy thoughts after thee. What he meant was that you thought how this world should work. You arrange the world to work by certain mechanisms, certain laws, certain principles. And I am finding those principles. So you thought these thoughts and I am thinking these thoughts now. What that means he saw his scientific discoveries as almost spiritual insights into mechanisms made by God. Now this is a very beautiful way of synergizing science and spirituality. That what science is discovering is actually the mechanisms that were put in place by God. And with this vision, science, the study of science becomes a means of appreciating the glory of God, appreciating the brilliance of God. Mm -hmm. It's so subtle and sophisticated are the ways in which God has fashioned this world. Now, unfortunately, uh, while Newton's legacy of scientific research is appreciated by many modern scientists, many modern scientists regret. They say it is unfortunate that Newton was such a religious nut. So now what went wrong or why this his particular Newton's view fall out of favor among subsequent generations of scientists. So what happened with time is that there is theism. This side. Theism. Hmm. Theism is the idea that God is the creator and God is the controller. But from there, as science started studying more and more of the mechanisms, it started seeing that the laws of nature are universal. That's, the, that's the, one of the core assumptions, like Newton's law applies everywhere. And the more we explored science, it did seem to be true. It seems to apply everywhere. So what happened was that it, they started saying that the controller now is the laws of nature. And yes, the creator may be God, but God is not in control. Let me say, what is the meaning of this? They suppose, say if we have a watch, watch over there. Now this watch was clearly made by a manufacturer. And the manufacturer used a mechanism to make the watch. But is the manufacturer controlling the watch now? No. So, now it is the mechanism that is controlling the watch, not the, not the designer of the watch. So, when we use the two arguments, design requires designers and law requires law of maker, these are two different arguments and the two are not necessarily compatible. That, that the design need not come from a designer. The design can come from a law. That means if you make a machine which works according to a particular algorithm, then each pot coming out of this machine, each metal, each uh, utensil coming out of this device, like each product coming out of this particular assembly line should come in this way. Then what happens is the design is not a result of the designer. The design is a result of the law. Now you can see the law has come from a lawmaker who had the design in mind. That's true. No doubt. But when you start saying design is coming from a law, then the role of the designer becomes much more distanced. It becomes much more distanced. So basically what happened? This ideology is called as deism. Deism is that God is the creator but not the controller. 
So the example is of a clock. In fact, this was the common metaphor, the clockwork universe. And the universe is like a clock. So it's a mechanism. And so what happens is here design comes not so much from the designer as from the law. Now we can say the law comes from the designer. That is true. But what has happened is the specific each design is not coming from the designer. It is coming from the law. So this was the idea that spread over the centuries. Why did it spread? Because science started seeing more and more that the universe works according to mechanisms. And while it works according to mechanisms, we don't see God intervening in the mechanisms. Now, there are examples of miracles and we'll shortly discuss about them. But most claims of miracles were questioned and debunked. And they said, so the idea became that the laws of nature are supreme. That there is no, no violating or breaking the laws of nature. Now from here, it was only a step forward towards atheism. That the creator and controller are both laws of nature. So one of the key theories that brought about this thinking was evolution. Because what did evolution say? That evolution talked about survival of the fittest. But it also proposed not just survival of the fittest. As far as survival of the fittest, evolution is, when it is talking about uh, the adaptation which enable, enable people to survive and other things, that's fair enough. But whether evolution can explain not just survival of the fittest, but arrival of the fittest. There are two different things. How does the new features and new species come about? But evolution started claiming that. So what happened is, now laws of nature could explain the creation itself. So was the claim. And because of that, as the hand of God on the canvas of the universe, it had already become faint. Now it was just deleted. So now scientists, the mainstream opinion, science is, they don't say it is, uh, it, they say it's functionally non-theistic. That we don't care whether God exists or not. That is irrelevant. Laplace wrote a book on uh, on the study of the universe and he gave it to the French emperor at one time. Laplace was from a, from a mathematician. Many of his studies, Laplace formulas and other things when he studied that. So, so, he presented a book to the French king at that time. And the French king just went to the book. He said that uh, there is no mention of God in this book. And Laplace replied that I have no need for that hypothesis. So he said, I can explain the universe without God. I have no need for that hypothesis. So essentially what has happened is that the idea that both creation, how the universe was created and how the universe is controlled. Modern science, or at least a significant uh, number of scientists today, hold that there is no need for involving God in explaining it. Of course, this can be countered. But why am I talking about this is that we shouldn't simply be demonizing if scientists are not theists. It's not because they are demons. It's not necessarily because they are envious. It is they have grown in a particular thought system. Now with this background, let's look at a familiar verse from the Bhagavad Gita. That is... 7.7 Krishna says over here Mattaha Parataram Nanyat So Krishna is saying Mattaha and apart from me Parataram beyond me Na Anyat there is no K 
किंचित अस्ति इवन स्लाइटली धनंजय ओ अर्जुन यू आर द विनर ऑफ वेल्थ बट द ग्रेटेस्ट वेल्थ टू अर्न इज टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट इज नो रियलिटी बियॉन्ड मी देयर इज नो रियलिटी सुपीरियर टू मी सो नान किंचित अस्ति धनंजय किंचित अस्ति धनंजय then somebody may say but you know you are saying that there is no reality beyond me but we don't see you so krishna says mai sarvam idam prutam in everything i am pervading how sutre mai gana eva just as a necklace there is the thread the thread is invisible but the thread is there everywhere मयि सर्वमिदं प्रोतम मयि सर्वमिदं प्रोतम सूत्रे मणिगणाइव सूत्रे मणिगणाइव सो लेट्स रिपीट सेट टुगेदर मत्तह परतरम नान्यत किंचित अस्ति धनंजय मयि सर्वमिदं प्रोतम सूत्रे मणिगणाइव so krishna himself is acknowledging right at the beginning that his presence is invisible and it has to be perceived with intelligence not so much with the eyes that when we see a necklace with our intelligence we understand that there has to be a unifying thread for the necklace without that it won't work so what is the gita's understanding that god is like the underlying unifying thread of existence underlying means he is not visible unifying means without him anything will not stay together will not cohere together thread for everything the underlying unifying thread so now we may say this is just a metaphor how does it actually explain things <clears throat> so when krishna speaks he is telling that or the gita's world view broadly speaking is that krishna has arranged this world most of you know the ishopishad word om purnam adah purnam idam see this world is complete in itself if you consider management there are different kinds of management mm. there is the least efficient management is where the manager does everything <laughs> then you are not a manager uh, you are actually the executor isn't it the most efficient management is that the manager seems to do nothing and yet everything gets done isn't it that what is the most efficient system of management it is not as manager is constantly running here oh i have to do this or oh, this is not working that is not working the systems are set so well that the it's not that the manager is redundant because the nature of the world is always no matter how well a system is made things will always come up ad hoc things will come up things will go down but overall the best system of management would be where even in the absence of the manager things should go on smoothly so krishna system of management is such that he has set up the universe to function even without his constant intervention now there's another way of looking at it that everything is sustained by krishna krishna is present as the paramatma but again the paramatma is invisible it is not the paramatma is running around hey this planet has gone off the orbit let's bring it back now <laughs> <laughs> so it is that the whole system of cosmic arrangement is made so efficiently that the manager that the manager is invisible so if we consider even from a practical perspective there are there are systems which are automatic now any automatic system what does it mean it doesn't it just mean that it has a good designer 
the greater the design, better the designer, the more automatically it can work. That actually a good a good designer will make it such a way that the designer is not required, but even the operator is not required so much. So again, the point is that automatic will work very efficiently. Now you could take it further, and there is there are nowadays self-learning systems. Self-learning system means say now if you use some transcription app, then first it may try to transcribe and it may get a make a complete mess of things. Especially most of these transcription apps are developed in America, so they just don't get Indian pronunciation. And it takes time, but over a period of time, they start getting it. Now, if the apps have the self-learning capacity, actually that only proves how intelligent is the designer. That doesn't prove that the designer is not required, that there was no designer. It proves that the designer is so intelligent that the designer has invested self-learning capability in the app. So it, it actually, the self-learning system requires a better designer. So from that perspective, the idea of, see the term evolution also has many different notions to it. Uh, sometimes when people ask, you know, can evolution and scripture go together? So basically we have to see at what evolution means. So evolution, if it means that observed changes, then there is no need to argue with that. Changes are always happening. And we observe the changes. Then there is an inferred mechanism by which those changes happen. And then lastly, evolution is like an all-explaining ideology. All-explaining ideology that is an alternative to God. So how did the universe, how did life come about? By evolution. So when we look at how what Prabhupada talked about, he was talking about primarily this level of evolution is incompatible with, with scripture. But evolution is observed changes, there's no problem with that. Evolution as an inferred mechanism, if the evidence is strong enough, again we have no problem with that. If you see in the Krishna book itself, Krishna, it is said that Krishna learned one of the skills and that was plant breeding. 24 things that he learned, 24, 64 skills that he learned in the Gurukul. One of them was plant breeding. Now plant breeding basically means what? You take this plant, you take this plant, breed together and some hybrid comes out of it. So that is very similar to the idea of evolution. So the idea that species can have capacities to adapt, adapt to their environment and change accordingly. This is not, this is nothing contradictory with science. In fact, that actually, uh, so that is not nothing contradictory with God. In fact, that proves God's intelligence mm. that he could make nature with self-designing capacities. Now, we're not saying here that any and every claim of evolution is true. But generally, when debates happen, uh, we have to be very clear about terms. So most of the time, what happens is evolutionists offer evidence for the first. These mechanisms are there. And they use that evidence as a proof for all three. We have observed changes that in, in certain environments, certain changes occur. And that is true, there's no denying that. But from there, when all three are taken, and oh, therefore evolution explains everything. No, not necessarily. What is it that can be explained by this? That has to be carefully seen. So Krishna will now talk about the natural world. And he talks about the natural world, he will talk about the defining characteristics, the essence of various things in the natural world. And what he'll say is that these represent him, that the taste of water comes from him, the fragrance of the earth comes from him. That when he's talking about these examples, the key point is he is illustrating is that how do we perceive that there is a thread underlying the necklace? That requires intelligence and Krishna has given us pointers to that. Pointers to seeing the thread underlying the necklace. So for a devotee, like I said, the Newton's understanding has never been actually refuted by science. So I'll make one point about how a devotee can see God along with acknowledging the laws of nature. 
so just like the law of gravity uh, do we have to do we have any issues with that it's a law and it's arranged by krishna krishna talks about gama vishuchi bhutani dharayami mojasa he says that now that actually he enters into the planets and he 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 sustains the planets so now what happens is where science over extends itself and where <laughs> scripture or rather you could say scriptural teachers can over extend themselves this is where conflict comes up science over extends itself means what that what science finds is that there are mechanisms now for example now gravity is a mechanism now is a mechanism a description or a explanation this is one of the most serious philosophical questions which as there is science and there is the philosophy of science and most of us we study science but we don't study the philosophy of science so for example that newton is in the law of gravity every particle of matter attracts every other particle of matter by force directly proportional to their mass and inversely proportional to the distance between them now this is we say the law of gravity now is this a description of what happens or is it an explanation of why it happens yeah actually speaking if you think carefully about it it's a description this is how things interact and as a description <coughs> full credit has to be given for the the brilliance of the inside by which the description of a of a observation of a pattern of observation could be postulated in such precise mathematical terms but a description is not an explanation so why do particles of matter attract each other oh it's because of gravity what is gravity it is the force that causes particles of matter to attract attract so you see the cyclic thing over here that where is the explanation over here so now of course scientists say that we are we are investigating how nature works that's true but what are we doing so are we describing how it works or are we explaining how it works so the, the, the real point is that here science gives a description now for many people the description seems to be an explanation why it is fall because of gravity well not exactly then conventional times sometimes we use that you know okay like uh, even for behavior so why did this person get so angry or such a small thing oh that person is short tempered person well short tempered means that person gets angry over small things is that the explanation sometimes we use it like that okay but what are we doing over there okay we just trying to make some sense of the person's behavior but then you could always ask what do you mean by short tempered person it is a person gets angry over small things <laughs> is it <it'd... laughs> so now if we actually wanted to understand why did this person get angry over small things then maybe we have to go deeper in the psychology maybe this person has control issues maybe this person grew up with a adult who had control issues and that adult there may be that i was talking with uh, one american devotee a black american devotee he was telling me that when he grew up that he that the only way to resolve differences of opinion were two ways raise your voice or raise your fists <laughs> that was all that he learned <laughs> he said that was the only way he lived in a very tough neighborhood and there's just no way other way and he said even after he came to bhakti he said that you know this whole idea of trudadapi surya was unacceptable for me <laughs> it took him time so now so that kind of thing is something we could say is the explanation why do you think that why do you get angry over small issues oh this person has insecurity or control issues 
that person is going to lose control of things. That could be some kind of explanation. So the point is that to use a description as an explanation is not intrinsically wrong. Most of the times we do that. That why is this person like this? Oh, this person has insecurity issues. Oh, okay. We say like that. But but we have to at least when we are going into deeper analysis, the description is not an explanation. And most of the times, what science gives is a discrimination. Now, if you really go into the core of science, science does not at all claim also that, or at least if we look at science from a philosophical perspective, what, what is the science is doing? So if you see the steps in science, the observation, then there is, uh, there is, we observe something, we try to see, uh, see some patterns in it try to come up with theory, then you set up some experiments. And from the experiments, we arrive at some conclusions, some inference. So now what are we doing actually here? We are trying to trace, we are trying to make sense of how things happen. And we are coming up with actually descriptions. So descriptions in themselves are not explanations. So the scientific way of looking at things and the spiritual way of looking at things these are not incompatible. So when and Newton said that I think thy thoughts after thee, what it means is that he is observing and that statement can be true even now. Science gives us a description of how things happen. But what is the explanation of why things happen? It is ultimately God's arrangement. God has set up the mechanism. So now God's expertise is that he is invisible and intelligence means we should be able to connect what is visible with what is invisible. In fact, if you see any kind of progress, some people are seeing is believing. Well, the first casualty of that idea seeing is believing would be science. Huh. Why? Because start, science does start with seeing, but every single scientific theory is basically about propose, it starts with visible phenomena. But after that, it comes up with invisible principles for explaining those visible phenomena. Like say, falling objects is visible. Gravity is invisible, isn't it? So if you consider any significant advancement in science, the laws of thermodynamics, the laws of motion, they are invisible. So seeing is believing is not only unspiritual, it is unscientific. Now you can say, yeah, yeah we can see the results. Okay, that is true. But the, the principle that you are talking about, that cannot be seen. So, actually intelligence or you can say intelligence or progress in knowledge. If you want to move more quickly. Progress in knowledge, it basically means we move from the visible to the invisible. So, now science moves from the visible material to the invisible material. Gravity is also material. But what Krishna is saying over here, you move from the visible material to the invisible spiritual. Not just spiritual, but the invisible divine. So when we see the interesting things in the world, the striking things in the world, we understand that this particular feature, it actually comes from God. It comes from God. I'll make one last point about this and then we'll move forward to the next section. That, see, even within science, as a science tries to explain the world that we observe. But, if we look, start from the subatomic particles and then we can come to atoms and we can come through various levels. From there we come to the world of 
sensory experience. This world of sensory experience is filled with colors, tastes, fragrances and so forth. So now exactly at what phase in the combination of subatomic particles or neutrons, or electrons or protons or whatever, where does smell or fragrance or something like that emerge in this? And that is a still a mystery within science. Now we may say that, okay, you know, this particular chemical has this color and this particular, this particular object has this particular smell. This has this particular taste. That's, that's again an observation. That's a description. But they, if they are all made of the same fundamental particles, the same atoms, essentially similar atoms, they are made of new electrons and neutrons. So from electrons and neutrons, at what particular point does a combination of electrons and neutrons and protons, all of them, at what particular point and by what means does that combination suddenly start acquiring smell and fragrance and taste? Or fragrance and taste and color and all these things. So now, now we are not saying that this doesn't happen. Obviously it happens. I am not saying that science does not have an explanation. But most of the time, I am not saying that, but most of the explanation is simply a description. In terms of purely causal mechanisms. In terms of how does this happen? Oh, you know, when this and this element come together, this happens. That's a description. But, you know, when you combine these particular elements in this particular way, this happens. So we can see, yes, this is the mechanical arrangement. But that mechanical arrangement has something more going on in it. And that something more is where we can perceive the hand of God. So a devotee does not have to be unscientific to actually be spiritual. What we see is, when we see the special characteristics, anywhere, you can see the special characteristics are a manifestation of Krishna. Say somebody is a spectacular singer. Now, if you just look at it from a biological perspective, anatomical perspective, if just, if you know, somebody took out, uh, somebody, you know, extracted, for example, some of the cells from the throat of a mediocre singer and a great singer. Would we see any difference in the cells? Maybe, you know, the muscles might be stronger because the person has sung more. But in the cells itself, do we see any difference? No, we won't, isn't it? So, where does the, Krishna says, I am ability in people. So, if you consider, say, somebody is a great batsman like Tendulkar, if you studied the you know, the biological x-ray of his hands or his wrists, some players are very good with their wrists, you studied their wrists, would you find their wrists to be strikingly different? Is the, maybe, yeah, maybe their wrists are a little supple, but there are so many people with supple wrists, that, that doesn't make the, that supple wrist doesn't make them, anybody with supple wrists doesn't become a great player, isn't it? So, the, when we talk about ability in people, the, does the ability have a biological correlate? Of course. You know, if somebody's hand is fractured, they cannot be a great batsman, obviously. But is the physical structure of the hand enough to explain the ability of the person? No. So, again, you remember I, earlier I talked about this, that any event can be explained in terms of material mechanisms. But that doesn't mean that there is no room for non-material factors. So if there is an event, so event could be say for example talent. Talent, there is definitely a material mechanism for this. But the material mechanism, beyond that there is a non-material factor also. And that non-material factor is where we see the hand of Krishna. So. Krishna is saying that when we want to fix our mind on him, he is not saying that you turn away from the world and fix my mind on him. Just forget the world. No, in the world itself, there is there are things which you can see as 
amazing. Einstein said that there are two ways of living the world. One is to see nothing as a miracle and the other is to see everything as a miracle. Now, everything as a miracle means that we understand that that doesn't stop us from looking for material mechanisms to explain it. But we understand that the material aspect is only one aspect. There is something more going on over there. So, in this way, when we are looking at, you, we can think of whatever it is that attracts our attention. The same thing will come in the 10th chapter again in the Bhuti Yoga. But it's important that we discuss it here also. That whatever attracts our attention, whatever is essential, defining in this world, there is a material aspect to it, but there is something more than the material. And that something more than the material is Krishna. The necklace has pearls in it. And no, nobody is denying the existence of the pearls. But just because the pearls are there, doesn't mean there is nothing more to the necklace. So you could say the material mechanism is like the pearls of the necklace. But the non-metal factor is the, is the thread. What is something more? So we see Krishna in the world not by denying the mechanism by which the world works, but by understanding that there is something more beyond these mechanisms. Now this will, this something more, after we shut off the water, then you will be able to make sense of the verse 740. So we will discuss a couple of verses in this chapter and then now 714 is well known verse. Daivi ya esha gunamai. Krishna says this material world it's interesting the first describer that he gives to material energy is Daivi. Daivi means divine. The divine indeed is this material energy. Esha gunamai made of the modes. Mama maya duratyaya. So, Duratyaya. Duratyaya means it's very difficult to overcome. So, what is, now we generally talk about in terms of it in terms of the temptation and the sensuality in this world, it's very difficult to resist that. But in the context of this section, what is Krishna saying? That it is very difficult for us to remember Krishna while we are engaging with the world. Because the Maya of the world is such that we will get caught in the material side of reality and we will forget that there is something more. Duratya, very difficult. But he says, Maam Evaye Prapadyante. That means if you surrender to me. Now, here Krishna is saying surrender is a conscious act that we have to do. Then your vision will always stay above the illusion. You will be able to see beyond the surface. Mayam etam. You will go beyond that. So let's recite this verse. Daivi Esha Gudamai Daivi Esha Gudamai Mama Maya Duratyaya Mama Maya Duratyaya Mame Vaye Prapadyante Mame Vaye Prapadyante Maya Metam Tarantite Maya Metam Tarantite Together. So, when we are looking at the world, naturally we look at the material factors because we have to function in the world. But the difference is if we see Krishna conscious vision. It doesn't mean don't see the material. Don't see the material factor. That the material factors could involve all science as material factor. But it that's not either Krishna consciousness. It's that it's that don't let the material factors be the only thing we see. That we understand that there are other factors also involved over there. Hmm? But we have to remember the non-material. So when we make that conscious act of surrendering to Krishna, then Krishna will remind us of the non-material. And thus we will stay above Maya. 
Now, after talking about this, the Krishna will then say that how most people will turn or will not come to him. Namam Dushtuti no Mudha. A well known verse where he says that because this illusion of the material over the spiritual is so strong, most people get caught in the illusion. Dushkutino Mudha Prapadyante Naradhama. Maya Aparita Jnana. He says, what happens to these four categories of people? They do not surrender. So, let's look at this from the perspective of perspective vision. See, there is, okay, let's put this way. This way. If we consider, there is the totality of reality. Hmm? Now, reality has a material veneer. Veneer means an external covering. And then there is a spiritual substance underlying. Ultimately, the spiritual substance is Krishna. So these four categories of people. So Namam Dushkritino Mudha. Ah, so there are four kinds of people. So who do not come. So well, let's look at these four categories of people. So Mudhas are their vision doesn't go beyond the material. The vision is not intelligent enough. Vision stuck in the material. Because they are not intelligent enough. Now, what is the other category? Let's go to the extreme and come back. Asuram Bhava Mahashrita. What are, what, are, what are the issues of the demoniac? Actually, they don't want anything spiritual to be there. So that they can control it. So it's not that they can't see, they don't want to see. Asuram Bhava. That... The existence of God is a big problem for some people. And the solution is just to claim non-existence. So, Asuram Bhava means where because they want to control, then rather God not be there. So, they just don't see beyond the material. Now, Namaham Dishwita Muda Prapatinti Nadhama Mayaya Aparita Jnana Asuram Bhava Mahashita. So now Naradhama, these are four categories. Now what happens with the Naradhama, broadly speaking, is that so these lack, these, the Mudha is the one who lack intelligence. The Naradhama, the Naradhama are those Naradhama. What happens with them is, they are dominated by animal desires. Animal desires means what? See, one is some people are just not philosophical intelligent, but some people are so controlled by lower desires that the material is all that matters to them. That, you know, okay, I am enjoying your body, you are enjoying my body, and that's all there is to it. So, this may not be outright demoniac, it is just that their desires have not evolved anywhere beyond the animal desires. And because of that, Animals, they are largely driven by biological instincts. They just don't perceive anything higher than life. So, these are also people who just don't see anything beyond the material. So, Mayaya Aparita Jnana. Mayaya Aparita Jnana. This means what? That these people, they just, they have intelligence. So, first is no intelligence. Second is too much desire. Too much lower desire. It's not necessarily, they are not demoniac, they are not anti-God, they are not, but they are just too caught in animal desires. Now, here the Maya Aparita Jnana is, there are people who are fascinated only by the material. That they just can't go beyond and this is how they just stay stuck over there. So, when this happens, we all have a mind and an intelligence. Some people's mind just is caught either with desires or some people's either their mind. So basically, let me explain some other way over here. Everybody has a mind and an intelligence. You can say that my intelligence is associated with the reason, logic, mind is associated with desires and emotions. So, some people, they just have 
too many desires. Hmm. Hmm. These are the Naradhama. Hmm. There are some who have too little intelligence. That is the Mudha. Hmm. Some people have hmm, intelligence. That intelligence is too caught in matter. It's not that they don't have intelligence. But their intelligence is too caught in matter. These are Mayaya Apaharita Jnana. And then there are two dark desires. Dark means demoniac desires. So these are Asuram Bhava Mashita. So all these people cannot perceive anything beyond the material. Now, in contrast with this, Krishna will talk about four categories of, of people who do approach it. So, generally, in the material world, we are looking for two things. We are looking for gaining pleasure and we are looking for <coughs> avoiding sleep, avoiding trouble. Mm -hmm. So based on that, <coughs> can I move ahead? Or? Okay. So generally in the material world, our motives Primary motives are material world, it is either want, we want pleasure, we want to avoid pain. So now sometimes, now again we look at this is the material and beyond the material, there is the divine. So sometimes when people have desire for material pleasure, but at a material level, they are not able to fulfill their desire for pleasure. Hmm? Then what happens is the desire for pleasure. That can take some people. I want material pleasure, but I'm not able to get it by material means. So maybe there is something higher which will help me to get this material pleasure. So who are these people? Artharthi. They are seeking Artha. Artha is wealth is for what? Material pleasure. So there are many people who after trying, hey, you know that, maybe you know, there must be some God somewhere. Maybe I should pray to that God. That's one way of it. Now another is that people have trouble. And by material means, they are not able to solve their trouble. Like doctors may say that many times they say, now this, this case is out of our hands. Now it is the time for prayers. What that means is now materially we can't do anything. So it is sometimes the fear of trouble. Fear of trouble can take someone beyond the material. Oh, there's too much trouble. Is there someone out there who will help me? So this is the Arto. They are in distress and they have tried various material means to resolve distress and they are not succeeded. And therefore, they look for something beyond the material. Now the third is that those who are curious. Okay. You know, I want to generally there, let's put it this way that there, okay, I want to learn about many things. Some people say there's something beyond the material. I also want to know about it. So, so if you see these true are largely driven by the mind. Oh, I want pleasure. I want to avoid trouble. Maybe there's something beyond. Let me pray to that. Let me say that. The curious, those who are curious, those who are inquisitive. So when Krishna uses the word what are the artho, artharthu, jignasu? 
those who are curious they are they may be curious of many things like they may be curious about history about geography like that they may be curious about religion also about spirituality also this is one thing they want to know so that intelligence that their intelligence basically studies matter and studies things beyond matter also like that and then there are the gyanis these are the wise people so these are people who are driven by their intelligence the curious are is there something out there beyond matter i want to know the wise are there is something beyond matter that is the ultimate reality that is what i want to pursue so in this way this covering of illusion the covering of matter the who are the people who see beyond the threads sorry beyond the pearls to the thread <coughs> so those are the people who to continue the metaphor oh this pearl is broken how do i how do i fix it i don't know how to fix it it is some higher uh, now how did this pearl come about there's something more to the necklace in the pearl let me find out they're curious there's some who are convinced about it i want to know about it so those are the gyanis the pearls this is the thread so the, who goes beyond it now krishna also these four categories of people who go beyond it krishna says that among these who is the best the wise are the best the gyanis are the best so he says it can take many lifetimes to come to the level of the gyanis but eventually that it can be bahunam jirmana mante but if somehow somebody associates with devotees then that whole process can be accelerated so what what is the difference primarily between the gyanis and the others for everyone else the material reality is what matters and maybe there is something more beyond it if it is there that's nice but for the for the others for the gyanis for the wise the spiritual reality is what matters and that's what they want to focus on so now after this krishna talks about devtas and he talks about impersonalists and the same things will come in the ninth chapter and i'll discuss them at that time over there you want to focus on that at this point but what is krishna doing overall in the seventh chapter he is showing us how the entirety of material existence can be seen in relationship with him <clears throat> that we can look at the things in the material world and we can see how how krishna is related with them how krishna exists beyond them we can look at the people in the material world and then we can see how they are having different dispositions in relationship with krishna and thus we can see there that they are also connected with krishna so from this perspective if you consider this chapter when krishna starts talking i I'll, so that mai asakta mana fix your mind on me now it's not that krishna is saying turn away from the world and fix the mind on me but it look at the world and fix the mind so in 4 to 6 krishna is saying how he is the origin of the world from 7 to 13 how he is he's talking about he is the underlying essence of the world and 14th of course he makes a call to surrender and by surrender one can get the vision to see everything then now from 15 to 24 he's talking about different people in relationship with him and then from 25 to 30 <coughs> he will talk about bondage and liberation in relationship with him how not knowing him or forgetting him causes bondage <coughs> and how knowing him brings liberation so of this we'll focus on when we discuss this theme will be repeated in chapter 9 we will discuss that at that time much more that theme of 
become and of course it will come in chapter 18 also but just a quick this the different people relationship with him let's see what he talks about i'll explain that he talks about two extremes those who surrender to him those who reject him so those who reject him i talk about 15th verse those who surrender to him i talk from 16 to 19 and then uh, so krishna is the central reality now in between these two people these two groups of people those who surrender to him and those who reject him are those who surrender to um, something it is at one level other than krishna but it is also something it is something other than krishna but still it is related with krishna so what are those so from 20 to 23 he will talk about the devatas those who surrender to devatas and he will show how the devatas are also related to him and those who are surrendering to devatas at one level they are going somewhere else but that somewhere else is also within Krishna because Krishna is not just one person in existence. Krishna is the person who sustains all of existence. So this whole idea of Devata worship is fascinating and discussed in the in the, 20, in the 9th chapter. And then in 24th verse, he'll talk about those who surrender to the impersonal Brahman. And in this way, Krishna gives as a broad spectrum of all of humanity that we can see everything and everyone as connected with Krishna in some way and when we see that now that doesn't mean we keep looking around at the world to try to see Krishna connection it's not that we have to look at Maya to see Krishna in Maya it's that while we are functioning in the world we will perceive the world and if we have the proper vision we can see Krishna while we are perceiving the world. We don't have to go out of our way to perceive the world. But while we are perceiving the world, we can go deeper and perceive Krishna within the world. Um, when I started going to America, I started attending interfaith conferences as a representative of the Vedic tradition, specifically Vaishnavism. And then, you know, See, in the in in in, in religious discourse or inter-religious discourse, there are different modes of interacting. Broadly, I just I'll talk about this seeing Krishna everywhere. That what happens is in inter-religious communication, when different religions communicate with each other, there are Three broad ways of looking at it. One is apologetic. Now, apologetic doesn't have anything to do with apology. The different rule. Apologetic means it is religious apologetics is a big field that we explain how I am right. What I am doing is it makes sense. Now, ironic is where both of us are right. Our right is maybe right is not the right word. Both of us are doing something similar. Maybe right is as I said, right is not the right word. What I am following or believing is sensible. <coughs> It is sensible, it is valuable, it is transformation, all that comes in that. And then there is polemic. Polemic is basically, you are wrong. <laughs> so basically, it's like, I meet with you, and either I try to, I, we have two different opinions. One is, I try to prove you're wrong, or I try to, ex try to ex explain, it's, it's wrong, again, wrong is the wrong word, you are insensible. Hmm? It's similar, but... Let's not use the. 
you are insensible. So either what you are saying doesn't make sense, what I am doing does make sense. Or yeah, actually what both of us are doing, something similar, it makes sense from various perspectives. So generally, in, in, in whenever there is an agenda for conversion, then it's polemic that is used. When we are trying to explain our rationale, that is apologetic. But when we talk with people of other traditions, the, what we do is ironic. You know, so there I noticed that, see in India, Christians are often both insecure and aggressive. They are trying to convert others and they feel we are a minority, we are being targeted. Both ways it is going on. And so Indian Christians have never been able to have any meaningful dialogue with them. It's just that they have very much of either a victim mentality or a savior mentality. That, that we are being victimized by the majority Hindus and we have actually the saviors who will save Hindu society from the darkness of darkness of their religion, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in America, because Christianity has for centuries suffered the attacks of science and they, they don't dare to make too many bombastic claims over there. Much more People just reject you if you just make too many uh, self-righteous claims or as, uh, unjustified claims. So it's anyway, I mean, not all Christians there are like that. But at least the Christians who come for interfaith, they are at a certain level of evolution. So when I went there and I was talking to one devotee friend of mine, the senior devotee says, what do you, you know, how do you come over here? What, what, what are you, how do you see your Krishna consciousness in relationship with you? relationship with this. He said, so I want to see how Krishna is acting in other religious traditions. That it is the same Lord. It is not that Krishna is acting only within the boundaries of his con. Isn't it? <laughs> Krishna acts everywhere. So Krishna is acting in other traditions also. And I was talking with one, uh, so one Christian priest. He told me that you know, he had come to he initially grew up in the Christian tradition believing that any path except Christianity is the path to hell. And then he said initially he was, he started coming to interfaith not because he thought there was any value, anything valuable to learn. But he said it was just a PR operation. Hmm? Public relations, we want to look good, we want to look broad minded, inclusive, so we go for interfaith. But then he said there was a conference which was held in that one of our temples. So he came and stayed in the temple and then he stayed for about five days and when he was leaving, this was many years before, before this conference, he said that my guest asked, my host asked, him, how was your experience? He says, very difficult. And normally some guest comes at our home and they're leaving, how was your experience? Very difficult. We were concerned, you know, what does it mean? <laughs> so he said, so, sorry, was it uncomfortable? Did, did we lack anything in our service? He said, no, no, no. He says, oh, your hospitality was excellent. But he said that, you know, I, while I was staying there, I would come for your morning, morning program and morning prayers and your singing. <laughs> and he says, I could clearly see the devotion in your prayers, in your singing, in your dancing. He said, I saw your you are chanting to be more religious than spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you are sleeping and chanting. <laughs> <laughs> but he said that although he said that although a major part of me wanted to resist it, but I could see that you when you were dancing and singing in front of the images in the temple, what you were experiencing was not much different from what I see my parishioners experiencing in my church. He's the leader of a church. Parishioners are the members of a church, like we call a congregation, parishioners. So he said, I realized that what you were experiencing was not much different. So he, he said that seeing the genuine devotion and reconciling that with my Christian education was what was very difficult for me. And I'm still trying to figure it out. 
So yeah, I so the, our host he told me that I after I talk with him over it, he says he said I appreciated his honesty. Right? He said he didn't try to necessarily profit. He had been taught that all other paths are the paths to hell. But at least he had that openness to experience. And when his experience challenged his education, I said, yeah, this is difficult. How do I reconcile the two? So what happens for all of us that many of my, my devotee friends, uh, they are from Christian background, especially in America, and especially in interfaith, they, they are invited at Christmas to the churches, and they go to churches. There's one time, in, I was only one year in December, I was in America because when I was in America, everybody, most Americans or Western pilgrims or people who are uh, seekers, they come to India. And in, if uh, to do Western outreach in India, December, January are the peak months. Rishikesh and other places are filled with Americans. They have vacation over there. So only one year I have been in America. And when I went to a church and they had invited me to speak for five minutes and then the pastor spoke and they led the prayers and everything. So, whatever be the specifics of their beliefs, you know, when they were singing their prayers, you know, did I experience something similar to what I experienced in Kirtans? Well, not exactly, not to that degree, but there was something I experienced over there, which was in a similar direction. So, it is that our faith, if it becomes broad enough, we see Krishna acting in various places. And that way, that mai asakta manaha, that is possible for us in various places. So even when we go to Dev, we'll talk about Devta worship specifically later. If we go to a Devta temple, if we have to because of a family deity or whatever, and there is Devta Kirtan is going on, might we experience something over there? Are those people experiencing something over there? <coughs> is that the ultimate spiritual experience? Maybe not. But is there some spirituality in that experience? Is there something higher? Definitely there is. So this vision that Krishna is giving us of how he pervades all of existence. Now how exactly he is pervading existence? That may be difficult for us to perceive. But he is pervading all of existence. And that way we understand that the, the universe is beyond simplistic labeling and categorization. That the universe is not simply materialistic. That the universe, people are not just simply sectarian. That the Krishna pervades all of existence. So different religions, different organizations, different theological conceptions, different ideologies, different political systems of administration. Underlying all of them is the thread of truth. So Krishna is acting everywhere. Now that doesn't mean that everyone's action is necessarily favorable to Krishna. That is also a very important thing we are discussing in the ninth chapter. That, this, that Krishna, is, is, does everything that happens, is it Krishna's plan? That is, that is a question that we get in Arjuna's mind also. Is Duryodhana's being so evil Krishna's plan? Is Duryodhana not listening to Krishna when Krishna went as a peace messenger? Is Duryodhan rejecting Krishna's plan also Krishna's plan? <laughs> <laughs> so that is what we will discuss in the ninth chapter. Ninth chapter will be a very fascinating discussion, which we will do right now. I will summarize what we discussed today. So we, we discussed chapter 7 and 7.1 we focus over the amount of time how the texts can be seen in a linear way and it can be seen in a more analytical or structural way. Structural of the structure of the meaning of structural chapter. So the idea is that by hearing, by hearing we gain knowledge and by that we come to the level where our mind becomes attached to Krishna. So that is the process that Krishna will be describing in this chapter. And how does he describe it? He talks primarily, this was the major part of our chapter, this was Krishna and material nature. What are their, what is their relationship? So it could be either transcendence completely 
it, that is God exists only beyond nature, it could be immanence, he exists only within nature. The Gita says it is both. He exists within nature as its essence. Essence of nature. That is, the we discuss how the, the specific defining characters of matter, of material things, are actually difficult to explain, explain materially. So we discuss how, you know, the fragrance, it, it comes from material objects. But if we take it down to material atoms, molecules, at a fundamental level, what we get is a description, not so much of an explanation. So if we consider the way that it is coming, that fragrance ultimately comes by Krishna's arrangement. So Krishna is the essence of nature, at the same time that sorry, not Krishna is not essence, the essence of nature is Krishna, but at the same time Krishna's essence is beyond nature, that Krishna has his existence beyond nature and that's how Krishna can free us from material nature. So here we discussed also about how the history of science went from theism to deism to atheism but it is atheism is only one possible interpretation of the study of nature as done through science so the same event could be explained by material mechanisms and it could be explained also by non material mechanisms and both could be true so the event of say the falling of an object it could be explained through gravity but then that explanation is more like a description and then Krishna's arrangement is the is more of a deeper explanation. So we discussed about how different categories of people, those who, who can see beyond matter to Krishna. So we discussed <coughs> In terms of desires, some people have their desires, naradhama, their desires just are there to enjoy this world. Uh, and they, they enjoy material things, they don't think about anything. Like asuram bhavam, they want to simply control more and more. And then there are those who are just either mudha, so their intent. So these two are based on their mind. And mudha are those who they just can't see beyond matter. And, they, they, and the Maya Aparitar, those who are so fascinated by matter that they can't see beyond it. And then we look at the look at those who do approach Krishna. Hmm. So there are four categories. They go from their desire for pleasure, and they want to see is there something beyond which can help me fulfill my desire? There's trouble. Someone who can help me save the trouble. There are those who are curious and then there are those who are wise. The first two are driven by their mind mostly and there are those who are driven by their intelligence. So among these the wise are the best. And then we discussed how this chapter is offering. It's both, it's a Krishna centered vision of the entire spectrum of reality. All of reality can be seen in terms of relationship with Krishna. So, in terms of things, the things we can say their origin comes from Krishna, their essence comes from Krishna, and then we talk about people. Those so some people seek Krishna, some people seek to reject Krishna, and there are those who seek. Krishna in some other way. They are seeking Krishna only the ultimate reality, but they worship some Devata or they worship the Brahman. And then finally, when we understand this, then we understand also how bondage happens and how liberation happens. So bondage happens by disconnection with Krishna. 
and then when you connect with Krishna, the liberation will happen. So how exactly that will happen? Let me discuss in the subsequent chapters. Are there any questions or comments? like you discussed about the philosophy of science and in that there is description and there is explanation. So regarding that, uh, I wanted to just know that and like Krishna says that he is the taste of water. But particularly in, if anyone like say tries to reason it, it might be because of water has particular amount of minerals or <coughs> something like that. So if that particular amount of minerals are there in particular concentration, then we can say that that particular taste will come. So, how is it a description or is it an explanation? Okay. See, that differentiation, mm, what we talk about description and explanation, when, when we are claiming to have a cause-effect connection between things, this is happening and how do we explain this is happening? That's why we are saying this is the cause. So, is gravity the cause of a falling of object? Well, yes, but it's a property of the object. So, is it? So, so you got the difference between explanation and cause, like a explanation and description there. Now, when Krishna is giving something, I don't think Krishna is doing either of those things. Krishna is primarily giving Arjuna tools for remembrance. Krishna is giving. Arjuna means by which he can be remembered while observing the world. So now, is the taste of water ultimately an arrangement of Krishna? Yes. Now, can that arrangement of Krishna come through material mechanisms? Why not? So, technically speaking, if we look at it from a scientific perspective, science holds that water, is, water does not have any taste intrinsically. Whatever we call as the taste of water comes from things that are added to the water. Mm -hmm. And that's why what you said about minerals and other things being present, that's talking about, uh, that's not talking about the taste of water, they're talking about the taste of uh, the attitudes to water. Now, there can be natural attitudes where the, we are in a particular river and we can taste the water of Yamuna and the taste water of the Ganga and it may taste slightly different. But when Krishna is talking about the taste of water, he's not talking about the taste of his attitudes. He's talking about how that's why this particular specific thing, I think we discussed earlier about philosophical speculation. Isn't it that how uh, in the Sankhya analysis of material nature that the property of taste is associated with water. That like I, like I explained that we are not able to taste anything unless there is some liquidity involved. Mm -hmm. they, now, there can be some food items, solid items, which have no like like bakery items or not, like uh, some items which may have no water in them or very little water in them. But the water comes from our saliva. So if there's no water in the saliva, then we can't just taste it at all. Okay. That's the point. That's why I don't think this is either an explanation or a, a description. It is a tool for remembrance. So, we should be able to see like this. It's not a causal mechanism. Prabhuji, law, law of karma is an automatic phenomena or the control by the Krishna? It is ultimately controlled by Krishna, but it is not that Krishna is Mm. Krishna is not partial. Mm. Which is that verse? Karmana Daiva Nitrena. So, karma does it work automatically? See, basically, uh, it's a little more complicated because when we talk about karma, mm, it is, uh, we sometimes. <coughs> compare it or even equate it almost with the Newton's third law of motion. Right? To every action is an equal opposite reaction. But the problem there is that uh, 
how do you really determine the quantity with respect to physical force I throw it a ball this much force out it bounces up physical force is very easily measurable but when it comes to karma if i speak hurtful words you now what is the karma in that the one day when devotee asked me prabhu i have a very serious philosophical question okay if i insult someone but that person doesn't get the insult then do i get the karma <laughs> 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 is it you know if you have understanding of karma then why take the risk at all is it <laughs> but the thing is that when when karma comes up there are three factors what we did the content of our action why we did the intent of the action and the consequence what resulted from it so all three are involved in determining the reaction So, for example, somebody tried to rob a bank. Now they go and they they go break through one gate and exit the second gate. But before they get to the where they get to the safe, and they're not able to crack the safe, and they come back. So they didn't succeed in robbing. That means actually they didn't rob. So are they considered criminals? Yes. Well, yes. The intent was there, isn't it? Now, of course, if somebody succeeds in robbing. the crime will become much bigger isn't it so the intent matters the content matters the consequence also matters so now how do you exactly determine intent uh, because the consequence can be determined but what is the gravity of the consequence you may insult two people and one person may feel terribly hurt and the person may not feel terribly hurt that was hurt it depends on where that person is in their life if that person is in a secure state internally then they just brush off the insult But if that person is already vulnerable, is depressed, that time he insults them. That person may even become suicidal at that time. So my point is that quant- measuring karma itself is not an it's not a mechanical activity. <coughs> it it you cannot it cannot be done without some higher intervention. So there is some involvement of karma of of the higher reality of ultimate super soul. in the governing of karma but krishna is not personally biased against anyone it is not that krishna says i don't like you so i'll give you more reaction i like you so i'll increase your reaction it's not like that yes now now devotion does affect it and we'll talk about how devotion affects in the ninth chapter but when the devotion affects also that is krishna being reciprocal based on our behavior it is not just a a random personal preference so in that sense krishna oversees the law of karma and because the law of karma involves human intent it involves assessment of uh, damage uh, which is often which also has a subjective element to it that's why it cannot just be entirely a mechanical there has to be a divine intervention You are overseeing in it. Okay. Last question. Uh, Prabhu, you told like, uh, like you gave the example of talent and how we can get an explanation, get a description through the material mechanism. Uh, how can we see the non-material factor in it? Like, can you please guide us? Like, I am not able to see. Yeah, it, it's durutte. It's not so easy to see. <laughs> there are many different theories that are the Christian theologians that try to propose it. Sadhguru so Prabhu has tried to take the Vedic literature and try to propose something. So, see what do Sadhguru so Prabhu, the devotee scientist Richard L. Thompson. So, I talk about two, three different. Uh, not scientifically rigorous but scientifically uh, formulated ideas what we do see is that uh, things in the material world happen according to the laws of material nature to what an extent science observes <coughs> science observes things uh, in terms of material mechanisms and that is perfectly true 
say if a billiards table is filled with billiards balls mm. now a stick is hit from one particular direction and then a ball goes into the hole over there now in terms of laws of physics we could explain it the stick was hit like this and then this hit that ball and this hit that ball that ball that ball and that's how that ball went that's explain it so is the explanation correct yes is it it is is it complete well you could say that there is clearly the skill of the billiards player now that skill is not a mathematical analysis of force is it it it's more like an intuitive understanding if i hit the ball in this way even in carrom you know if i hit this if i hit this with that and then that will go into the hole now when we do it we are not calculating mathematically over there you may not even somebody who is playing carrom may not even know about the specific term laws of laws of motion or whatever hmm? but there's this intuitive grasp of some certain things so this intuitive grasp is not based on mathematical calculation hmm. even if we could do mathematical calculation how do you ensure that my finger or my arm will move with only this much force and not that much force it's not mathematical so there is a room for a mathematical explanation and a personal explanation both to coexist and even in science uh, when they do scientific research so this idea of considering non mechanical factors is there like if scientists we talk about in the discovery of course also but now let's put it from this perspective that when scientists say uh, they are archaeologists are digging up the some place where there is ancient civilization and they find a pot with some artistic markings over there so now they will try to evaluate whether these could have come by mechanical means just the natural movement of water and wind and air and things like that or is it of sufficient level of complexity that it would not have come by that so that means that what what are we saying over here is that even in the study of science that sometimes when we see an effect we try to see whether it has come purely by mechanical factors or it has come by non mechanical means personal agents that kind of inference is done in science also so in what is the branch of what is the branch that studies crime called not narcotics is some word when sorry poly forensic forensic sorry a forensic yeah so then forensic say if somebody has uh, somebody has died and then we do um, we find as poison in their body now we try to evaluate could this poison has just come from <coughs> um, natural food could it come is it because of food poisoning is it because of some accidental overdose is it because of intentional overdose so what's happening over here is that we see a material effect and we try to see whether it has a natural cause or it has a personal cause personal means the intention of the person or the intention of some other person to poison us so like that we can in general in our day to day lives the idea that there is something non material over there mm-hmm. that is something which is very implicitly understood non material i means not just mechanical say one day we come home and our mother cooks a beautiful cake for us and you know say today is not my birthday yes mother said today is the 25th anniversary of the day when your first tooth came hmm now 
if we didn't ask our mother and if we employed the best scientists in the world okay. how they could study that cake as much as they want but will they be able to figure out why the cake was made <laughs> is it right so now the making of the cake they can come up with a perfect analysis of all the chemicals in it all the calories in it all that is there in the cake but the manifestation of the cake the material mechanisms are perfectly right but there is a personal intention over there and the personal intention is something which no amount of mechanical analysis can ever tell us so is the material mechanism, material mechanism not useful of course it's useful like that cake is very tasty we want to know the recipe for it uh, the recipe doesn't just come just by mechanical analysis but that we want to know what are the component composition of that's fine but the composition of it why it has come by the mixing of some ingredients it has also come by the arising of some intention in one's mother so these two are not incompatible and both to both of them can very well coexist one doesn't reject the other so same way what what we understand is that that is the the beauty of a flower from biological perspective we can say why is the rose flower so beautiful okay this is how the roses grow this is what happens this is how we can come up with its its intuition goes like this its gynation like this its staples are like this its stamen are like this its carpels are like this all that those terms we can use and is angled in this way this is shaped in this way this is in like a whorl so we could give a description of what makes the apple beautiful so not apple the rose beautiful but that description is that a sufficient explanation is a valid explanation for uh, is that a complete explanation could there be something more to it yes it's possible isn't it that's what we're talking about here okay so thank you very much for your thoughtful participation shri bhagavad gita ki jai shri prabhupad ki jai gaur bhakt vrind ki jai ai gaur prema ji ki jai hare krishna hare krishna krishna krishna